Okay, time for our message this morning. And I want to uh, just bring us back to the book of Revelation this morning. A number of you have already uh, shared some feedback about last week's message. It seems as if every time we speak about Revelation, people get excited and they want to learn more. So well, this morning we're going to continue with the look at the two witnesses and their role in uh, the uh, book of Revelation. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 11 verses, and we'll read the whole chapter just to get a perspective on it. So Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. It says, And there was a given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have sh uh, shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt where our also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of, and of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there, there was there a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and let's uh, commit this time to him that we might understand his word uh, more fully. Father, we do thank you that we can come before you this morning and we can uh, meet in this way. We do thank you for your word and we do pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless me in order that I might bless uh, those who uh, are hearing and listening to this word this morning. We thank you for this word that we can trust. And we do pray that our hearts, our minds would be open to receiving this word, that we would continue to be transformed into that image of your only begotten Son. If there are any here this morning who are listening uh, to this message, uh, who don't know you, who don't have Jesus as their Saviour, I do pray that this would be the day when their eyes are opened and they would receive him as their Lord and their Saviour. Father, we do pray. Lord, for each and every person that's listening this morning, that you'd be a blessing to them, that this word and message would be a blessing to them, and that we might be a blessing to this world. We do thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I look at the, uh, the media, um, and I listen to uh, news broadcasts and read articles and newspapers and things of that nature, um, and the way it describes things sometimes, I must admit that my confidence in their ability to simply tell the truth without inserting either their own opinion or embellishing the story sometimes uh, runs a bit low. Uh, in the past few months, I'm not sure how many times the word unprecedented uh, has been used, um, that these are unprecedented times. Um, if you probably look back and, and listen to every news reporter and every read every news article, you'll probably find that it's been used thousands and thousands of times. And they probably copy each other and they do that because they all want to make sure that they've got the most important news story out there. But um, the word unprecedented is an interesting word. Um, it means that it sets the standard for everything else that comes to follow, that everything else now will be compared to that, that there was nothing before it that was that's ever been like it. Um, that's what a precedent is. 
Um, and they're comparing these times as unprecedented times. In other words, nothing's ever happened like this before, and, and this is going to set the standard for all future uh, events uh, of this nature. But obviously there have been other pandemics uh, that have ravished the world, um, and it doesn't take much time to, to study and find out that there's a thing called the Spanish flu, which was uh, an obvious one. You know, COVID, if you look at the, just simply the numbers, uh, COVID-19 has uh, so far uh, infected about 10 million people, the ones they've seen, uh, in the world, uh, and it's killed around 500,000 people. Now, those are terrible numbers. 500,000 people dead uh, is, a, is a, an absolutely drastic and terrible number. There's no doubt about it. Um, and it's still growing. It's still continuing to grow. But is it unprecedented? Well, when you compare it to previous, some previous pandemics, it actually isn't. It's not even close. The Spanish flu infected some 500 million people. So we've got up to 10 so far. We have to get 50 times what we have today to reach even the number of infected. And we have, our population in the world is more than double, at least, uh, what the world's population was before. Um, so the Spanish flu infected some 500 million people and killed an estimated 50 million people. Um, well, the, the, the COVID-19, the coronavirus, has killed 100, uh, sorry, 500,000 people. 500 compared to 500 uh, 500,000 compared to 50 million is not even comparable at the moment. In addition to this, the world has endured other pandemics. The Black Death or bubonic plague killed some 25 million people, it's estimated, and didn't just last a, a year or two. It lasted hundreds of years and kept breaking out around the world. Um, the world has also endured disasters, famines, two world wars. I mean, the, the First World War killed about 20 million people. The Second World War killed, killed about 85 million people. Um, we've also endured murderous regimes um, that have killed over 100 million people. When I think of the communist regimes in, uh, in the Soviet Union or Russia, uh, in China, Pol Pot, if you, if you just group together those people that they killed, and they killed their own people uh, in order to gain that, uh, that, uh, that power, they killed over 100 million people of their own. And you look at Hitler, responsible for at least 6 million deaths of people that he had cooked, uh, gassed, murdered, shot, um, people that were either Jews or, or other minorities that didn't fit into his plan of domination. No, no, these are not unprecedented times, as difficult as they are. And we might think, oh, you know, it's, I've never experienced anything like this uh, before. Well, maybe we haven't, but the world has. The world has experienced some pretty bad times. Um, but the Bible speaks about a genuinely unprecedented time, which will be coming up in the future. The Bible speaks about that particular time, which will last seven years, um, but the last three and a half years of those seven years will be unbelievably unprecedented. Those last three and a half years, the Bible speaks of as the great tribulation, a great time of testing, a great time of, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, devastation in the world. A time, now let's get these, these numbers right here, um, if the Spanish flu killed 50 million people, then according, if the numbers in Revelation, if I've got those right, about two and a half billion people will die, um, will perish. At least a third of the world's population will perish. Now, it could be more than two and a half billion, uh, depending on the world's population at the time. It will be during these times when our two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, will return to fulfill their ministry and call the people of, of Israel to repentance and to the Lord, as well as the people of this world. So we are continuing our look at these two men, and this follows on from the, the Mount of Transfiguration, where they showed up, where Jesus was uh, transfigured in front of his disciples, and the role they played there. And what we're looking at is their role in the future, when they come back. And the reason that they are there with Jesus is to, is to confirm who he was. And the reason they come back again is to do a similar thing. 
So we looked at, just to recap quickly, we looked at Malachi last week, and, it's, and we read from Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, which says, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Um, we looked at their message. Uh, the message of his two witnesses shall be concerning the turning of the hearts of the children of Israel, the modern day Jews, um, to the, the fathers or the faith of their fathers. And when I speak of their fathers, I speak of people like Moses and Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, and Elijah, the faith of their fathers, which many of them have abandoned. Um, and, they will, and they will turn the, the hearts of their children or the hearts of the children of Israel to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, pointing again, like they did on that mountain, to him as being the promised one, the saviour of the world. They will say, they will teach the world that he is not only just the Christ, the Messiah, but the Son of God. In this future time, they will witness to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah and that they should turn to him for salvation. We saw last week that the great and dreadful day of the Lord could not be the first coming of Jesus because that wasn't dreadful at all, but it refers to the second coming of Jesus Christ and that would be preceded by these two individuals who would prepare the way for him. And if you look at verses uh, 3 and 4 of Revelation chapter 11, it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. Uh, sackcloth is a time of mourning, uh, is, a, is a show of mourning and repentance. Uh, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Remember what I said they represented? They represented the, the law and the prophets of the Old Testament, as they did uh, when they came to, to a witness of Jesus on that Mount of Transfiguration. And we looked at and confirmed um, who they were. Uh, and we looked at the, even though this passage that we're reading speaks of only two witnesses, it doesn't mention Moses and Elijah by name. We looked last week at how their uh, identities are confirmed in a number of ways. Moses and Elijah are mentioned in our verses in Malachi before the coming of the Lord. We looked at the miracles that they uh, that these two are said to uh, have done or will do in those days, the power that God gives uh, to them. And um, they, when we looked at them in detail, they closely mimic the miracles already done by Moses and Elijah in the past. Miracles such as fires and plagues uh, and even stopping it from raining uh, were miracles that they had done before. Both Moses and Elijah finished their lives also in very unusual circumstances. Elijah didn't actually die. He was taken up straight into heaven uh, on a chariot in, in a whirlwind. And the Bible says that Moses died in the most unusual sort of fashion. It says that he wasn't um, weakened. He wasn't uh, frail. He, was, he's, he, didn't, he still had, he was a strong man. The Bible says that he's, his eye wasn't dim, so he had perfect eyesight. And uh, when he died, no one saw where he was buried. In fact, no one buried him. The Bible says that God buried him in a secret location. And the devil got so concerned, I think, about that, um, that he demanded the body for himself. The devil wanted the body of Moses for a particular reason. And um, we might know what that, we might conjecture about that. But uh, there was something going on about the way Moses died that died that seemed to indicate there was something going on. So whether it was the way they died or they didn't die, whether it was the miracles they did before, whether it was the fact that Moses and Elijah seem to always be mentioned together uh, in the Old Testament and, and show up together in the New Testament, uh, and the fact that God says that Elijah will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, which is still to come, um, all those things sort of pointed in one direction. And we see that they will be a thorn in the side of Satan and his plans to rule the world. So both Moses and Elijah were called by the Lord at times. And so let me give you some other, some other perspectives here. So we, we understand um, how these two individuals, um, God prepared in time past 
for this new job coming up that they uh, have yet to do. Both Moses and Elijah were called by the Lord in time past and at times when their people, Israel, were under the oppression of evil kings and at the risk of succumbing to false religions and false gods. When Moses was called, let's look at Moses first, when Moses was called by God from that burning bush, his people were under the tyrannical rule of the Egyptian pharaoh and had become slaves. They were under oppression. They were in bondage, the Bible says. And though their faith was wavering, they were crying out to God uh, for salvation. The power of Egypt at that time, it was the world power. It was unassailable. And the power of the Egyptian gods, all of those different gods they had, seemed overwhelming. The God of Israel heard their cry, though, and he would save them from their dilemma. When Moses told Pharaoh to let his people go or to let Israel go, Pharaoh was so confident in his power, both earthly and, and, and from his gods, that he refused to let, uh, to let the people of Israel go some nine times. But with each successive plague that came upon Egypt, and God uh, uh, did through Moses, the power, both his power, his, uh, his earthly power, and the power of his gods became more and more doubtful. In the end, the God of Israel was so powerful that he put to shame the supposed power of Pharaoh, who was supposed to be a god in his own right, and all the gods of Egypt, who in the end were absolutely useless to defend Pharaoh and to, uh, and to subdue the God of Israel. We know what happened to the gods of Egypt, don't we? They were swept quite neatly into the dustbin of history and no one worships them anymore. When Elijah was called by the Lord, Israel was now in the promised land. Remember, Moses, Moses had saved them. They'd gone through the wilderness. They've, they've ended up in the promised land and now they even have their own king. They're in the promised land, but their king married a queen who loved, or who was a Canaanite and who loved the gods of Canaan. Her name was, and most of us would know this name, was Jezebel. And she hated the God of Israel so much that she had all of his prophets slain, except for some that they managed to hide in a cave. The people of Israel were in danger of forgetting their God and were now once again, not just in, in, uh, in physical bondage, but spiritual bondage and under oppression of their own king and queen. Elijah was pretty much alone, apart from these other ones that were hidden. Um, and he was the only one opposing Ahab and Jezebel. As a result of this, his own life was constantly under threat and in danger. But after causing a drought for three and a half years, um, which made Baal, the god of rain and thunder, who was the Canaanite god whom Jezebel worshipped, look rather useless and powerless. I mean, if, if he's a god of rain and uh, with a prayer, a, a Elijah is able to stop it raining for three and a half years, he's not much of a rain god, is he? But it came to a climax when God told Elijah to challenge all the prophets of Baal to, to, a, to a, a specific challenge. In that challenge, they were supposed to call on their god to make it rain fire to burn up a particular sacrifice. And after a full day of crying and praying and screaming and cutting themselves, the 300 plus priests of Baal failed to produce anything. Their, their sacrifice was just sitting on an altar, baking in a sun. But from one prayer from the prophet of God, Elijah, after just one prayer, the Bible says that fire came down from heaven and even though the, the sacrifice had been drenched with water and surrounded by water, that fire devoured the sac that sacrifice. Ultimately, the real God defeated the evil king and queen of Israel and all the Canaanite gods because there are always multiple ones floating around. And we all know what happened to the gods of Canaan, don't we? They were neatly swept into the dustbin of history. And people don't worship Baal and Ashtaroth today, even though they've tried to rename them and reclaim them. Aside from these gods, there were the gods of Assyria, another world power that took uh, Israel captive. There were the gods of the Babylonians who took Judah captive. 
There were the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, and the Romans, all world powers. And all of these world powers have disappeared off the face of the earth, as did all of their gods. All of these gods, all of these, whether they were Greek gods, Roman gods, Assyrian gods, Babylonian gods, Persian gods, and they're all very different. Where are they now? We know what's happened to them. They've all been swept into the dustbin of history. All because they all came against the people of God and against God himself. Listen to the Lord, though, when he warns his own people from chasing and worshipping other gods of the people that he will overcome. And when he gave his people the land that where they could live freely, Listen carefully to his reason. So turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29. And we'll read to verses 32 this morning. Now listen to the Lord. This is, this is still with Moses. They haven't entered the promised land yet. And he's telling them, be careful um, when I've saved you and when I lead you into the promised land, what's going to happen? So he's defeated the Egyptian gods and then he's going to lead him into another land where there are other people who are worshipping other gods. He says in Deuteronomy 12, 29, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations before thee, whether thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them. After that they be destroyed from before thee. And that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Or so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord, which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burned in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. So God tells his people, don't get lured in by the, the, the attraction that these gods would offer you. And he tells them, don't get, get lured by the, by the sin that they will uh, eventually lead you to, because they are, they are not gods in the first place. In fact, every verse, every reference in the Bible that you will find, you'll find three things that, that are common when God refers to other gods from other, thing, other nations. God never recognizes any other god as a legitimate god. He calls them either the works of men's hands or their imaginations, or that they are simply devils pretending to be gods. He also says that while men worship other gods, the God of Israel says that none of them ever created anything because he is the creator of all things. So from the beginning, this God, who some say he's only a Canaanite God, well, this Canaanite God apparently um, not only defeated all these other gods, okay, or all the gods of all these superpowers with a tiny, tiny nation who were often the actual um, the, the victims of these, these uh, major superpowers. He not only defeated all those other gods put together. He's still going today. Um, but he says, you know what? I'm the one who created all things. There is no other god beside me. Um, so don't get fooled into following them because they are absolutely useless. And he says uh, to those who are his people, he says, um, thus to fear them or to worship them, to fear those gods or to worship those gods is absolute foolishness. So his message to his people has always been, you are not to fear these gods and don't be enticed by them either. And their appeal to the flesh. You see, the things that these gods offer often appeal to man's flesh or appeal to the fallen nature. That's what they feel good to go chasing after. And he says, do not bow down to them. Don't pray to them. Don't worship them. And do not put your hope in them because there is no hope to be found in them. And this includes all of the gods that we ourselves have created in modern day society. You see... People not, might not worship Zeus, Apollo, um, 
or uh, Odin or, or those types of gods anymore. They might not worship Venus or Mars or Jupiter. They, they don't worship these sort of gods, but they've replaced them with other gods. Instead, our modern society has replaced those gods, the old gods, with modern gods. And we call those gods things like philosophy, and science, entertainment, politics, technology, intelligence, education, and so on. And so these are the modern days gods. Gods that many people have put their faith in. Gods that they have created for themselves. And the reason that people do that um, is that people need something to believe in. People need something to have confidence in, to make sense of the world that they live in and to give them some hope for the future. You see, um, the majority of people in this world, I'm actually might say the majority, but there are a good number of people in this world who have put their full confidence in science, that science is the answer to everything, that all of, my, all of the problems that we face can be fixed up with science, okay? So for those who are struggling with this whole pandemic, their hope is that science will find the cure and find the thing. But you know what? Pandemics still happen. People still die. Things come out of the, uh, out of the woodwork and, and science cannot deal with them fast enough. Um, people still die from cancer and heart attacks and everything else. As good as any um, uh, medical system is in the world, as good as the medicines are and the medical systems are, you know what? Everyone dies. And everyone dies of something or another. So as good as science is, as many, as many good things that it's given us, and I'm not saying science is a, is a bad thing, I'm actually saying science is a good thing, but it's not good to worship and put your entire hope in. For others, the solution is politics. They think politics will actually change the world and that given the right politics and the right the rules and regulations, that the world will be a, a future utopia. So there are those who are calling for socialism and those who are calling for um, freedom and those who are calling for all different types of things, um, thinking that the type of government and the type of rules and regulations that are in place will change the world. But we found that the, the thing doesn't change the world. Politics never changes the world because it doesn't change people. The world is made up of people and politics doesn't change people's hearts. Politics changes the environment that they live in. Now, that's not to say that politics is wrong, because God actually loves order. God says a government, any government, is better than no government at all. You see, God says anarchy is a terrible thing, because when there is anarchy in place, um, then there is no justice. People's natural uh, evil within them eventually comes out, and those who are evil begin to want to take control of those who don't have power. So people look to things to make not just sense of the world that they're living in and sense of the, of the universe, but to give them hope for the future. And for some, this is science. For others, it's politics. For others, it's a movement or a cause. When you're young, um, often you know, young people get, get wrapped up in causes. It gives them meaning in their life and gives them a purpose. The gods of Egypt and Babylon and Greece and Rome and all these other ones may have been discarded a long time ago, but they've been replaced with equally impotent gods. And most of these systems call for obedience. None of them can tell you, though, what's absolutely right or wrong. They have no system of, of morality. All of them seek to put man at the centre of that worship, in other words, man is the most uh, important thing. So, and what's the what's man's ultimate goal? Well, depending on what you're talking about, you know, it could be pleasure, could be happiness, could be greed, could be prosperity, could be whatever. It puts man at the center and 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 feeds him that lie that he is the most important thing, and they replace God with an ideology. And that ideology almost inevitably gives people a license to do what the very things that God said that he hated among the old gods. He hated people sacrificing their children to appease gods. And they did other detestable things. But the gods of this world allow the very same things. Whether you're worshipping gods made of wood and stone and silver, or you're worshipping gods of science and politics and intelligence, 
they all end up leading the same place. They all end up leading you to fulfilling your own lustful desires. Just because they're useful things, and they're all generally useful. Education is useful, intelligence is useful, politics is useful, science is useful, technology is useful. All these things are useful things. They are not things to be worshipped. In a future time, Moses and Elijah will be called once again to witness at a time when God's people will be in bondage. They will be oppressed. The world itself, the Bible says, will be under the rule of a tyrannical king who will have much of the world under his control and dominion. The king that shall compel the world to worship the God that he serves. The Bible calls it a God of forces. And the one behind all these false gods, the one who this one really points to, the creator of all the false gods and false religions throughout all of history, the Bible calls the devil. In the future, the Bible says that the devil will actually want to be worshipped himself. You see, all these other things that he throws into place have all been trying to lead to a particular point where he will be desiring to be worshipped openly, a Luciferian worship. And for those of you who don't understand what that name means, well, Lucifer was his name before he fell, the bringer of light. But instead of bringing light, he brought darkness into this world. And the Bible speaks of him and calls him Satan. Um, it, it, It called him a name after. It gave him that particular title after he fell. But before he fell, he was created as an angel of light an angel of unbelievable beauty, wisdom, power. The Bible says that he became enthralled with his own beauty and with his own wisdom and with his own abilities, and he wanted to be king king and God himself. He is the one behind all the false religions in the world. He is the one behind all the false gods in this world. And if you do a careful study of all the old gods that were that ever existed, uh, you'll find that most of those really have one of his devils, one of his demons behind them. In the future, he will he will want to be worshipped as the one true God, and he will have his own false Christ. He will also have his own false Holy Spirit. And he will even have his own false prophet to promote him. You see, the devil can only do one thing. He can only mimic what God has. Just as God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just as God sent his Son into the world to be the Savior of the world, and he sent uh, John the Baptist ahead of time to prepare the way, the devil plays the same game. He'll try to become a triune being. He'll try to become a... He'll have a false Christ to replace Christ. That's what antichrist actually means. doesn't mean against Christ. Antichrist means in place of Christ. And he'll even have a false prophet to be like John the Baptist or Elijah coming before. In the future, Moses and Elijah, when they are sent again, will be a witness against the false Christ who will proclaim himself to be the one and true Messiah and he'll proclaim himself to be king of the not just a country but the entire world and they will Moses and Elijah will demonstrate that he is actually a counterfeit Christ and that the God he serves is no God at all but a thief a liar and a murderer and he's been a thief a liar and a murderer from the very beginning when he tempted Eve to eat of that fruit and caused both Adam and Eve to fall and they at Moses and Elijah will be called again to lead their people into freedom. Where will they do this? Let's have a bit of a look and see where the location is where they will be doing this work. Look at Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. It says, And there was given me a reed like a rod, so like a measuring uh, 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 ruler. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple 
of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, without means outside of the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. Forty and two months. If you've got your calculator out, it's three and a half years. We are told that the place of their ministry shall be in Jerusalem, with its focus on the temple there. You'll notice that the outer court of a temple says it says it's going to be given to the Gentiles to tread underfoot, which means trampled down for three and a half years. But that the holy place, the holy holies, the, the, the main place where the priests served and, and the, the holiest place was, shall contain worshippers. But you say, well, but you may question, there is no temple in Jerusalem. Well, no, there isn't. Not yet. One of the landmarks of the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, remember there was there is a seven-year tribulation period. The first three and a half is called the general tribulation period. The second, the great tribulation period. The first three and a half years, not that bad. Some bad things happen. The second three and a half years, amazingly bad things happen. Okay, So in the first three and a half years, it involves the door being opened to Israel rebuilding her temple. And if you do a quick search on the internet, and you'll find this pretty easily, you'll find that preparation has already been made concerning the temple service. In other words, every tool, every garment, every sacrifice, and all the requirements that you would ever need to run the temple have already been prepared. There is already a group of people in Israel that are ready to go. As soon as this thing's built, they're ready to start uh, start this whole service again. So the Bible says that the temple will be rebuilt during these uh, first three and a half years of the tribulation. In fact, that's what starts the whole thing off. Um, but what about the priests, you might say? Well, where are the priests? Weren't they supposed to be only of a certain tribe of Israel, like the, from the Levites? The answer is yes. Have you ever heard of the name Cohen? Well, Cohen is a Jewish name. And if you're referring, if you ever met a person called Cohen, you're referring to a lineage of priests that go all the way back to Aaron. In fact, the Cohen family is supposed to be one who is descended from the priest Zadok. And Zadok, or Zadok, was the founder of the priesthood in Jerusalem when the very first temple was built by Solomon, King Solomon, in the 10th century BC. And through Zadok, he, who is related to Aaron, he is the first Jewish priest. So if you're, looking at the, if you're looking for priests, just look for a name called Cohen. And those guys are descendant of the first priest of the first temple. And there are probably more. You know, they've even... Um, created a genetically uh, modified heifer, red heifer. You see, one of the rules that, that states, uh, 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 that God states about in, in his uh, Bible about a particular sacrifice is that they needed a red heifer. A red heifer had to be red completely. It can't be like you know a, a cow that's a, a, or a, a bull that's half brown and half white or has got patches. No, no, it needed to be fully red from head to toe. Um, they've got that bull. They've got that heifer which is meant to be used in sacrifices. So they have the priests ready to go, the garments ready to go, the utensils ready to go, the sacrifices ready to go. They just need the temple. And that will come. And that is certain because the word of God says, has already recorded that it will come. And where is it going to be? Well, it's going to be in the same place that the Bible says it's going to be in Jerusalem, in the same place that it was before. And yes, Jerusalem is the same place where Jesus was crucified. So when does this happen and how long does this go for? So we know um, that Moses and Elijah, so we know the, sorry, the who, we know about Moses and Elijah, we know the why, so they're sent to, to turn Israel back to the Lord and preach the gospel and point everyone to Jesus, the entire world, for that matter. We know where, 
It's in Jerusalem with a focus on the temple. But what about the when? Well, the building of the temple will come at the beginning of the seven year tribulation, as I've stated, at the hand of none other, none other than the Antichrist. Yeah, the one who pretends to be Jesus returned, the one who pretends to be the Messiah, is the one who will proclaim himself to be the King of Kings. This is the one who starts a treaty who makes a plan, who makes an agreement and says, I'm going to find a way to, for you to build, rebuild your temple again. But his plans on this temple being built are nefarious. They're not right. They're not to allow Israel or the, or the Jews to worship in their own way. It's so that one day he can take that over. So Daniel describes the deal that he makes with Israel in this way, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he pictures in this particular verse, if you want to turn there, Daniel 9, 27, he pictures a day, sorry, a, a week as seven years. So, so one day, he pictures it like a year, okay? So if you look at it, it says in Daniel 9, 27, and he shall confirm <clears throat> the covenant, which is an agreement, with many for one week. That's seven days or seven years. And in the midst of the week, right smack bang in the middle of those seven years, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. He's going to stop them doing their sacrifices. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. He's going to do something in there so terrible and so um, uh, uh, such a, an abomination that it's going to immediately show the, the, the Jews this, that this guy doesn't have good intentions at all. Even under the consummation, and that determined, shall be poured upon the desolate, even right to the end when he will be judged. Uh, okay, so he makes a covenant or an agreement for a period of seven years. In the middle of that week, or after three and a half years, he causes the sacrifice to stop and he desecrates the temple midway through the week. Yes, three and a half. So, the time that the witnesses, what's significant about this particular time? Well, it's at this time that God sends these two witnesses and are given to, to, to prophesy and to witness to people in the world um, about what's going on. And this time is so significant in the history of the world that God has made sure that it was referred to many times in the Bible, both in the Old and the New Testament, and in many different ways. This future time when God sends Moses and Elijah is so significant. The upheaval in this world will be so great that anything that we experience during these COVID days will seem like a stroll in the park. Just to be clear, and a casual reading of the of book of Revelation will show this. The deaths and devastation will be so great during these final seven years, especially the last three and a half, that the world's oceans, the world's oceans will completely die. The world's drinking water, almost all of it, will be completely contaminated. At least one third of the entire world's population will be dead. Around two and a half billion people will be dead after this time. There will be wars that will devastate the majority of the earth, will involve most countries in the world. There will be famines, which we have never seen before, plagues, which we have never seen before, devastation so great that Jesus described it in this manner. In Matthew 24, verse 21, he says there, And then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. That's the, Jesus' own words about this time. To put things in perspective, and the reason why, another reason why this time is so important, is that at this particular time, the number of people who are alive on the earth right now are more than all the people that have ever existed in previous generations in the history of the world. That's why the Bible has so much to say about it. There are more people alive on this planet now than have ever been alive when you add them all up. 
So the massive devastation that we see will affect the world and the number of people so much more now than it, e than it ever has in the past. And the Bible speaks about this time in a number of different languages, a number of different ways. It calls it the Great Tribulation. It also speaks about it as the Jacob's trouble. Jacob referring to the time that Israel's own people. Those final three years come before the return of Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that's also given to us. And those three and a half years are given to us in a number of different ways as well. The Bible records this three and a half year period as 1,260 days. It records them in our passage as 42 months. It records them in Daniel as a time and times and half a time. It records it as a midway point of a seven-year period. Let's look at some other references to begin uh, with. Revelation 11, verse 1. Let's look at, look at some other references about this. So Revelation, going back to Revelation, verse 1, it says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city. They shall tread underfoot forty and two months. We discover that these two witnesses shall be given the freedom to prophesy for three, a full three and a half years in Jerusalem. This will be the time of Jacob's trouble described of by the prophet Jeremiah and other prophets some 700 years before John's writing. Jeremiah says it in this way, in, in um, Jeremiah verse, chapter 30, verse 7, he says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. How does Jesus describe this time? Well, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 to 22. This is how Jesus describes it to the people who will be living in and around Jerusalem at that time. It says in Matthew 24, 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand, then let them which are uh, be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight may not be in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So in other words, Jesus is saying, if, if these days did not come to an end, if God did not come and intervene and stop what was going on, no one was going to survive this thing. Everyone was going to die. The world would die completely. So Jesus describes it as a time of great tribulation, as prophesied by Daniel, the prophet, and it centers on the holy place in the middle of the temple. Where does Jesus warn people to flee if they see something going on in the temple? He says, those of you who are in Judea, run to the mountains. If you're on top of your house, don't even bother to go down. Start running from now. If you're in the field, don't even go bother to go back to your house. Get out of there. Judea is the, re is the region. Well, Judea is the region surrounding Jerusalem. It was originally really the, the place of Judah. It was Judah's um, uh, place or the southern kingdom in which Jerusalem is the capital. The imagery is so strong. The threat is so great that Jesus tells those who are reading these words, don't spare any time because a, dr a great tribulation is coming. And I love the, the verse or the description in verse 15. He says, whoso readeth, let him understand. In other words, for the, him who's reading it, let him understand what's going on. In other words, you'll understand when it's happening. And which I find interesting because how can someone on their rooftop, you know, if you look, read the description, he says, he who is on his rooftop or he who is in a field, when you see this thing happening, the abomination of desolation happening in the temple, um, get going. 
Now, how does someone on his rooftop and someone in a field manage to see something that's going on in a building, with inside a building? Uh, when it was written, it probably made, maybe didn't make much sense at all. But you know what? Let him who readeth understand. Maybe let him who has a mobile phone with a streaming video service uh, understand when he sees what's going on in the temple live on news broadcast. And what they will see on their mobile phones and what they will see on their TVs and what they will see on the internet um, will trigger the three and a half years that this the Bible speaks of as a great tribulation in the world, the final three and a half terrible years. Um, when we think of this tribulation period, we'd be wise to compare it to the slavery that, that Israel endured under Egypt and under Pharaoh. It was a time of great judgment upon Egypt. And the great tribulation will be an unprecedented time of suffering and judgment on the world. You see, more and more um, uh, plagues came upon Egypt until Pharaoh uh, let the, the children of Israel go. Um, and the world will be in a similar situation in the future. <clears throat> Moses and Elijah will be testifying for three and a half years against this wicked king who pretends to be the Messiah, who pretends to be the returned Christ, who will proclaim himself to be ultimately God himself. He will even set up an image of himself in the temple and he will demand to be worshipped. But despite his obvious evil nature, his lust for power, his boasting against God, the majority of people in the world will put their trust in him and they will worship him. In fact, the Bible says they will love him so much for what he does. They'll be so convinced that he is the guy for them, that he is the one that they can trust that they will allow themselves to be marked, to be tattooed with his mark and with his name because they love him so much. After the three and a half years are up, the Bible describes the result in this way. Turn to Revelation chapter 9 verse 18 with me. This is just to give you the, the picture here. By these three was the third part of men killed. So the third part of people in the world will be dead by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Um, that speaks of some pretty bad devastation there. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents and their heads um, and had heads and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, so, so just imagine this for a moment, a third of the people in the world are dead now because of some unbelievable devastation that's going on, which is when people are being killed by fire, smoke, brimstone, by the looks of it, it sounds like a, a massive wall with bombs and everything else going on. Remember, John is trying to describe what he sees 2,000 years ago. And how would he describe aeroplanes and, uh, and and jet fighters firing rockets uh, and burning people up. Well, it sounds pretty much like that. Um, even though a third of the people on the planet have been destroyed and killed, it says in verse 20, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils. See, they're still worshiping devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. You see, the problem with man hasn't changed. You go back thousands of years, man has always been lured by false gods to do things, to murder, to be involved in sorcery, in fornication, thefts and those types of things which these false gods allow you to do. In the future, what's changed? Nothing. Man still worships things made of his hands. He still worships these false gods and they will not repent 
They will not repent, which means they will not change their mind about these things, even though most, or many people in the world would have perished. You see, despite God having shown mankind over and over again that he is the one and only, mankind always finds a way and a reason to worship other gods. Gods they make with their own imaginations, they make with their own hands, gods that allow them to do what they want to do. But the reasons are very clear. They worship gods that they make in their own image or gods that, that they like because their own hearts are drawn to sin. These gods allow them to do the things they want to do. But the God of the Bible has proven himself over and over again that he is the one and only true God. He is the one who created all things. He is the one who gave us his word, the Bible, which you can trust from the first page to the last page of Revelation. He is the God who sent his own son into the world to save sinners like us from ourselves. So you see, that's the issue here. Every other God, every other religion in the world will tell you that if you try hard enough, you can get to heaven. You can earn nirvana. You can, you can get ascendancy. You can, you can go to the next level because it's within you. The goodness is already within you. The God of the Bible says, no, 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 don't look for the goodness within you because you've been cut off from me for, from the beginning. In fact, the, what's within you is a fallen nature and that fallen nature will continue to draw you away from me away from my nature, because those two natures do not go together. They don't live well together. So in order for a person to follow God, there needs to be a change of mind. There needs to be a repentance about those things. And then God can step in. There needs to be an invitation to say, God, I want you to come into my life. I want to submit myself to you. I know I can't save myself. And I need Jesus to save me. So it's only at that point where God forgives your sins by the blood that his own son shed on the cross and then comes into your life and gives you a new nature, a nature that is not corruptible, a nature that is like his, that wants to do the right thing and a nature that can never die. Every other way is a dead end. Every other way only leads to destruction. And what we find, if you read the Bible from the beginning to the end, what you find is a story of man's fallen nature seeking every other way to save himself, to earn merit, to do it his own way, to be independent, because he has a fallen nature and he does not understand it. You see, the Bible also tells us this, that the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart's a very deceptive thing, a fallen nature, and that, that fallen heart deceives. Yeah, people spend a lot of time deceiving other people, but that heart deceives even the person themselves. In fact, the biggest deception is within. And the Bible is the thing that opens up your eyes to the deception that's taking place within. And that's the biggest eye-opener that there is. When God opens up your eyes to what's going on and the fallen nature within you and what's been happening in this world for thousands of years and what's coming up in the world in the coming days, you have to come to God. There is no other way. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. It, it, he is the only way to get to God. Don't wait for Moses and Elijah to come back to understand that message. If you have a Bible and you haven't started reading it, read it. Understand it. Start from the gospel. See what Jesus said about himself and then compare it back to the Old Testament, whether what he was saying was true. Repent and turn to the Lord and he will forgive your sin. He will give you a new nature, one that's not inclined to sin. And he will give you a home in heaven as a gift. 
Not that we deserved it, not that we were any better than anyone else, simply because we were willing to humble ourselves before him and admit that we were wrong. Our job, if you are a child of God and have been adopted into his family, will be like Moses and Elijah, just in our days now. We need to be bold for the Lord in these days because the end will come sooner or later. We also need to be bold in the face of false gods and the hope that people put in these false gods. And it's not our job to say science is wrong or politics is wrong. That's not it. Our job is to say, you know what? There may be good things in that. There may be good things in that. There may be good points in that. Things may be useful. But we need to warn people about their inherent nature to worship and that we are created to be, to be beings of worship. We want to worship something. And so what we need to do is open up people's eyes to what they are worshipping, what they are put, what they have put in God's place. Because everything else, whether it's technology, science, philosophy, politics, education, whatever it is, none of it's perfect. None of it will ever give you meaning in life. Only God can. We are to be bold. We are to be the ones who share this message that Jesus Christ is the answer to this world. We are to tell them that there have pl been plenty of false gods in this world from the very beginning. And that plenty of people have died putting their faith and hope in those false gods who will one and will, and will discover that they weren't gods at all. That the God that we serve is the one and only true God. There is no comparison to him. He is the God of gods. Jesus is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. There is no one who can compete with him. No one who compares to him. Everything else is utterly futile and useless. God bless you all. I am... Um, Look forward to sharing the next part of this message with you next week as we determine the identity of this beast who manages to kill these two witnesses and they are found dead in the streets of Jerusalem. God bless you all. I pray you have a good week. Stay close to the Lord. Keep on reading uh, the word and have trust in Jesus as the Savior. God bless you. Thank you.